All right, so we're going to continue on. This is going to be our last batch of videos for Math 2580, and we're going to look at surface integrals. So last time, we introduced this notion of a parametrized surface, and so we had this idea that you've got some surface over here in R3. You want to be able to describe it. Essentially, you want to, you want to establish a coordinate system on this surface, right? You want to put some sort of grid system down, and so what you do is you come up with this vector valued function r, it's going to be a function of two variables, right? So you have r of say u v, right? And so what it's doing is it's defining x, y, and z as functions of u and v. Uh, and so then once you have this function, then of course every point on the surface corresponds to some point in, in whatever the parameter domain is, the domain D for this function. And the kind of natural Cartesian grid system that you have over here in the plane creates a grid system over here, right? Because you can look at curves of constant u or constant v. Uh, so in particular, the usual kind of, you know, i, j vectors pointing, you know, either to the, to the right or pointing up in the plane. Uh, they generate these tangent vectors, right, tu and tv, where uh, we'll recall that uh, this uh, tu is just dr du, tv is dr dv, right? r is a vector valued function of two variables. So when you take the partial derivative, uh, you again get a vector valued function so you get a vector by taking partial derivatives of x, y, z with respect to either u or v. Uh, the other thing that you get from this, well, there's two things you get. One is that since you have two tangent vectors, you can compute their cross product, right? So the normal vector is simply the cross product of u, of this t sub u and t sub v, right? And, and of course, this is a vector valued function, it depends on u and v, right? Um, and one of the things that you can do uh, if, you want, if we had more time, if we wanted to play around and we wanted to be rigorous about things, is you can, you can prove things like that the um, sort of direction of n um, up to, you know, whether it's pointing up or pointing down, which is this question of orientation, um, the direction of n only depends on the surface itself, okay? Um, the magnitude of n depends on the function that you use to parameterize your surface, right? So different parameterizations will produce normal vectors of different lengths, and so this is something that you might have to pay attention to in certain contexts. Um, but from the point of view of integration, this actually makes sense because uh, what you want to do, if you want to do something like area, and we, we saw last time that there is a formula for the area of a surface. And so we write it as this double integral over the surface. Um, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't call it S, um, maybe S a surface area. So the surface area is going to be the integral over S of this, this sort of surface area element dS. Uh, we kind of overuse the letter S when we're talking about surfaces. And so we gave a formula, and we said that the formula is the integral over d, over the parameter domain, of the magnitude n of u v, right? And you integrate with respect to u and v, okay? So the, the idea here is that the, the role that the magnitude plays is that if you have a little rectangle over here in your parameter domain, right? That's going to correspond to some little parallelogram over here on the surface, right? And, and so the idea is that if you, if you were introducing, say, a partition, you want to use a Riemann sum to set up the integral, right? Then each sub-rectangle in your partition over here becomes a little parallelogram over here, and each of those parallelograms approximates the area of some patch on your surface. And you want to know how, what's the scale factor, right? How much does the area get stretched or shrunk when you go from here to there? And we know basically from linear algebra 
that this normal vector is going to give you that scale factor, right? Because the area of a parallelogram is simply the cross product of two magnitudes that span that parallelogram. Um, the T sub u, T sub v, they might be too long, but you're multiplying by, say, a delta u and a delta v over here, and that shrinks them down to the appropriate size. Um, so you can make sense of this. Um, so we, we ended with this in the last video. I thought I'd just recap this, remind you, this is our surface area formula. Um, the other thing you can do is um, if, you, if you have a function, f of x, y, z, let's say, defined on your surface s, um, then you can integrate the function over your surface. So you can make the following definition. So we can define the integral over s f of x, y, z, ds. We can define that to be the integral over d f of, so we're so this notation here is indicating that x, y, z are all being written as functions of u and v via the parameterization, right? Times the magnitude of n, and then we integrate with respect to u and v, okay? Um, so this is the, the surface integral of a scalar function, if you like, just like we, we defined line integrals for scalar functions when we were looking at integrals over curves. Um, and just like when we were doing integrals over curves, uh, we do one or two examples with this. We realize that generally this gets pretty complicated because of this magnitude. Um, we don't do a lot of those integrals by hand. And they're, they're useful for setting certain things up, you know, for theoretical purposes, it's useful to have this point of view, but it's not going to be the most common sort of integral that we're interested in. Um, so pretty soon we're going to transition to integration of vector fields. Uh, but before we move on to that, we're going to do probably a couple of examples um, with computing surface area and maybe the surface integral of a scalar field. Um, so those will be the next couple of videos.